Welcome to our Foreign, Foreign Excellent webinar series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is a US-based service, service provider offering IP docketing, paralegal, analytics, and annuity services. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman, Lundberg, and Worcester firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we have pulled together experts to talk about strategies and best practices for patenting in key foreign countries. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Tim Opperman from the PMP law firm about patenting in Germany. The Foreign Excellence webinar series is free. Schedule and registration information for upcoming webinars in this series is listed on the Black Hills IP website at blackhillsip.com. We've allowed time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions may be submitted using the questions button on the right-hand side of your browser window. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation. We will queue the questions until the end of the presentation, where we will address them as time permits. My name is Greg Stark. I'm a principal with the Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wissner firm. My practice revolves around strategic portfolio development, opinion and due diligence work in a variety of technical areas, including software and medical devices. With me today is Dr. Tim Opperman from the PMP firm. I'll let Tim give you a little brief intro into his background. Hi, um, my name is uh, Tim Opperman. I'm a German and European patent attorney with the uh, PMP law firm. PMP is um, Penning, Mining and Partner. We have three offices in Berlin, Munich, and Dresden, and are an IP boutique solely focusing on intellectual property with a strong focus on patent prosecution. Um, thank you, Greg, for um, inviting me for this presentation, and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, when the time comes. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. So the first few slides of this webinar uh, will provide us a little bit of context around the German economy as well as the German patent system. Uh, and then I will hand things over to Dr. Opperman, who will walk us through the details of the German system. Uh, in particular, Tim t intends to focus on how the German system differs from systems such as, uh, as uh, the US system. So, First of all, the slide that's up in front of you provides us a good look at, uh, at the German economy being the fourth largest economy in the, in the world with a per capita GDP over $50,000. The GDP is broken down largely into industry and services with a small bit of agriculture. The next slide provides us a look at the top 10 German technologies in patent grants. So here in the next few slides, we've shifted to looking at you know, the patent system in general in Germany and providing some statistical view of you know, how that breaks down. Here, you know, the largest category is transportation, which really translates into automotive, as you'll see in the next slide. And there we, you know, we also look at things like engines and turbines, measurement equipment, medical technology, all the way down to pharmaceuticals. So a nice variety of things. Moving on to look at the top assignees in the patent system within Germany. Uh, it was interesting for me to see that Google is actually the number one assignee, at least as of 2016 grants within the German system. Uh, less, less surprising, I guess, is that uh, you know, a large portion of the other top assignees are made up by automotive companies such as Ford, Audi, Toyota, GM, Bosch, Siemens, um, BMW, Volkswagen. So I think that uh, you know, really speaks to the transportation being the number one category um, of, of patents you know, within the German system. So the next slide here is a look at patent filings uh, from non-resident filers. And this is, so this is direct filings into Germany by non-German companies. So here you can see Germany in comparison to a number of other jurisdictions, 
um, the numbers look fairly low. And I think part of this, um, as you'll see later, is, is largely skewed due to the fact that I think a large number of international filers, you'll come into Germany through the European patent system. You know, so they do, a, they, they do an EP, you know, patent application, obtain a grant within the EPO, and then get validated in Germany. And those numbers are not reflected here. This, is, this number is really just direct filings into Germany. And similarly to this patent grants, this is also patent grants that are from directly filed applications in Germany. So they, you know, these numbers look pretty low. Um, it, you know, I think in a vacuum, these might be surprising that, you know, that's lower than jurisdictions such as, you know, even Mexico or India. Um, again, I think this is very reflective of, of the fact that a large number of, of filers proceed into Germany through the, through the EPO system. Moving on to patents in force. Here, I think this is a, a numbers that are a little more reflective of how, how large the, the German patent system really is. You know, here, the German patent system jumps up above, you know, pretty much everybody in the, in the comparison other than uh, China, Japan, and South Korea. So we believe these numbers are reflective of, you know, all patents in force in Germany. Um, although these numbers don't include um, utility models, which, Dr. Oberman will tell us a little bit more about in just a moment. And finally, uh, a, a, a quick view at um, you know a snapshot of the lifetime costs of a patent within Germany. Um, you can see a German patent is is actually fairly expensive in comparison to a lot of its peers, um, largely because of the annuities being a little bit more expensive. And annuities are you know those payments you make periodically to keep a patent in force. Uh, so you know, Germany, it's a fairly expensive proposition to keep your patent in force uh, throughout the life of the patent. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Opperman, and he will uh, enlighten us about uh, the German system. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, well, uh, in the in the slide that Greg presented. Um, before you saw that the the approximate cost for getting a pat, uh, having a patent in Germany is actually quite high compared to most other countries. So um, before turning towards um, a, a, a brief introduction into the German patent system, um, I just want to get back to why one would actually get a patent in Germany. And um, I guess the, the 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 answer to that question is was already delivered in one of the first slides where it's, you know, it is one of the largest economies in the world. And um, besides being uh, one of the largest economies in the world, it is also the biggest market in the European Union. Um, and that offers, you know, several interesting uh, protective schemes. Um, for example, there are some industries, for example, the automotive industry, where uh, a patent in Germany offers you broad protection because very few um, car manufacturers might consider putting in a different brake system or a different pump system into the car in different jurisdictions. So they would like to stay with one um, producer of a brake system. And since a lot of the European car makers or a lot of the large European car makers are situated in Germany and produce their cars here, Having a, single, uh, having a patent just in Germany instead of um, different jurisdictions of the European Union um, might just do the trick to um, uh, move your way into the market. Um, furthermore, um, the, the patent prosecution is well tested and can be moved forward at different speeds. Um, Germany has known patents for a long time. Um, like. Um, over a hundred years. And uh, the system itself has become very efficient. Um, you can choose at which speed you want to move forward. You can um, wait a little up to seven years as uh, um, I'll show you in a couple of slides uh, before uh, examination of a patent begins, but you can also get protective, a protective, um, a patent to protect your product really, really soon in the form of a utility model, for example. The other thing that makes 
um, a patent in Germany is uh, interesting is that the patent litigation system is also uh, very efficient. So if you do believe that you have a patent that is being infringed by someone, there are several um, possibilities of how you can move forward and uh, try to stop the infringement. Um, so with that in mind, um, we'll just, sorry, um, move to the sort of topics that I want to um, give you a little bit of insight into. Um, as Greg mentioned in the very beginning, um, I'm trying to focus on differences here. Um, so I'll, I'll make a couple of assumptions and um, hopefully that works. And if it doesn't, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them um, as best as I can. Um, something that I've noticed, um, well, let, let me start a little bit different. Um, so I've lived in Germany most of my life. I've also lived in the US for quite some time. And uh, when you live in the different countries, you notice differences really fast. Half of the differences you don't notice, but there are a couple of differences that you notice. And ever since I've been living abroad, <clears throat> you know, the search for what, what sort of things are being handled differently um, has something that, that I've noticed in, in a lot of places where I go. Assuming, and uh, from, from most treaties that we have these days, um, a lot of patent systems are similar. Um, for example, especially with the American Invents Act, um, the um, first inventor to file is something that moved the US patent system closer to actually the German or most of European patent systems. So instead of you know trying to focus on or giving you a full explanation of how the German system actually works, I'm going to try to focus on a couple of key differences and hopefully that gives you an idea of that most things that I'm not going to talk about do run sort of similarly um, and that there are some things distinctly different and um, hopefully that, that will be the take home message that you've learned a little bit about the differences. So the topics I'm trying to cover is to go about the different paths to get to a German patent. Um, what are patentability and formal requirements um, to get a patent? I'm going to talk briefly about utility models as an alternative to patents. Um, I'll give you a very brief introduction into litigation and defense uh, once you have a patent or an infringing product. And then um, as a final thing, I'm gonna talk about the Germany Employee Invention Act, which may be of interest, especially for those of you who do have um, um, offices or branches in Germany that actually produce invention uh, records themselves. Um, because German employee invention, the, the Germany Employee Invention Act does provide a couple of provisions which I do believe are quite different from um, um, US law. Um, regarding the first topic, um, Greg mentioned it earlier, um, there are a lot of patents that come from non-residents or even from Germans these days that do not enter Germany through the German patent office, so to speak. Um, they do enter, for example, through the European patent office. They're being granted by the European patent office and thereafter you can activate your European patent in Germany, so to speak, and that's called German validation. So all of these different things lead to uh, our routes to a patent with effect in Germany. So quite obviously what you can do, you can file a Germany priority application with the um, German Patent and Trademark Office. Um, you could also do a foreign priority, such as a US priority, a Korean priority, and then file a Paris Convention filing in Germany also with the GPTO. Um, the other routes, um, the foreign priority, uh, to just um, round that up, could also be, for
for example, a European patent application. Um, the third option is to go via a PCT application, and there you can enter a German national stage directly with a GPTO after 30 months, so that's very uh, similar to the US. And as most of you who've done some sort of work in Europe probably know, you can also go through EP regional stage, um, where the deadline is a little later, so 31 months. And then once the e EP patent or EP patent application grants, uh, you can do a German validation. In the hopefully not so distant future, you might also be able to have protection in Germany via a unitary patent. However, uh, as that is still a symphony of the future, uh, we will not spend time to talk about this. Um, all of these are different routes how you can enter Germany. Um, what we're not going to focus on is any route that goes via the European system. So we're just going to focus on the first three options, Germany priority application, Paris convention filing, or German national state out of PCT application. Um, when it comes to the question whether you want to file a patent, it's obviously interesting if the things that you can get a patent for are different in Germany or um, and the US. And the brief answer is yes, it's a little bit different, not too different, but it is a little bit different. Um, patent eligible subject matter um, is similarly to other jurisdictions in the sense that it says um, in the patent German patent law, it talks about technical inventions. So these inventions do not include scientific discoveries, designs, um, algorithms, business methods, and software per se, uh, per se meaning that um, if it's software that just shifts bits around and these, this, it has no technical meaning, so for example, just resorting data, for example, um, then it might not be patent eligible. However, <laughs> to make things a little bit more complicated, um, of course you can do protect software to a certain extent in the sense of how you um, control a machine, how you uh, produce a signal used in telecommunications. And even though that could also be considered to just be a data stream, it does have a technical application. So the software per se is actually very, very much related to the algorithm uh, argument given before. Also not included in inventions is merely restating information. Um, so um, sorting, sorting cards into a card folder wouldn't be, that would be just reorganizing information and that is not necessarily patent eligible. Once we've jumped across the hurdle, whether it can be a technical invention, some things are explicitly excluded uh, from patentability. And here, I think it's a little bit, uh, or somewhat different from the US, in that um, you cannot um, get a patent for any parts uh, of the human body, in particular stem cells or gene sequences. So stem cells is not, or stem cell patents, uh, should not exist in, in the German patent system. Um, offensive patents is something that is also not patent eligible. And offensive here is just an abbreviation for um, essentially um, inventions that could be used to torture people or maim people or um, scare people terribly. That would be considered an offensive patent. Um, you can patent weapons. However, there is a, um, there's a, a, a thin line. And uh, to be honest, sometimes I don't really know where that line is. However, where these offensive patents do exist, um, but, uh, or they don't exist, 
because they're excluded from um, patentability. Human cloning and animal stem cell modification isn't patent eligible. Animal or plant breeding isn't patent eligible. And something that um, I often come across with, because we do um, we do a lot of work on medical technology, is surgical, therapeutic, and diagnostic methods, also excluded um, from patent eligible su uh, subject matter. So that that would be something that I find very different from the US. Um, in, in terms of formalities, um, personally, I find getting a patent in Germany a little mm, bit more simple or simpler than, than in the US. Um, so a minimal approach to a patent application is we need a written description and at least one claim. Um, the patent application can be filed in any language, however, um, if the language is not German, at some point a German translation needs to be filed. Um, that is true for national filings, Paris Convention filings, German national stages. Um, for um, the EP German validations, uh, we only need a translation of the German claims after we have an intent to grant. But with all the routes, directly end up in a German national patent, a German translation needs to be filed at some point. Um, what we also need is at least one applicant. Um, the applicant, um, you also need to name at least one inventor. However, this inventor needs to be named within 16 months. Um, the German patent office will not question whether the applicant is actually the eligible applicant. What they, the applicant needs to show is, you know, whether they gotten the right from the inventor by, by an employee contract or by any sort of contract, but the German patent office will not actually double check whether that's true. They will simply assume that the applicant is, has the right to file the application and get a patent for it. Um, the inventor does have the right to be named and an invention or uh, an inventor's uh, record needs to be filed in the uh, timeline of 16 months and um, the German Patent Office will, will tell them that you've been named as an inventor. However, the inventor can't really do anything. It's the applicant who communicates with the office. Um, furthermore, you need to pay some fees and um, the, uh, the application fee and the search fee, and both of them are really moderate, uh, for example, compared to um, the European Patent Office's fees. Something that um, I th think is interesting in the, in the German patent system is that no request for examination needs to be filed until seven years after the filing date. So while you do need to file a search request when um, filing the, um, the German patent application, you don't need to request examination. So essentially what you can do is you can say, well, I don't know if this product's gonna fly or not, or if we're gonna use this patent. You can enter, um, you can file a German patent application with the German Patent and Trademark Office and then just let it sit there for seven years. And if after seven years you're of the opinion that this is still something that is useful, you might enter examination. Um, however, if you choose to do that, anyone could file or could request examination of the patent. However, that could be, not be done anom uh, anonymously so you probably would know who is asking for examination. Um, so that would be a very minimal approach to, to a patent application. So not really much is needed. There are no declarations to be filed. Um, 
the patent office simply assumes that the applicant has the right to file the application. If that is indeed not the case, and one of the inventors is of the opinion that uh, the applicant is not the rightful owner of the application, then they need to file a complaint um, with the patent office, and the patent office will start working from there. However, there is not a third party that could ask for such a investigation from the um, patent office. Um, this makes things a little bit simpler when it comes to litigation because not as much, you know, there are not as many things that could result in a, a non-enforceable patent based on formal matters. So, um, if the applicant has no address or branch in Germany, uh, a German counsel is needed. Um, so, um, whether you need a German counsel is um, for, for German people or German applicants, they usually don't need a German counsel when dealing with a German patent office. However, as previously, uh, previously stated, if the applicant has no address or office in Germany, a counsel does become uh, mandatory. And I do apologize for misspelling counsel. Um, so, um, that was just a quick run through patents without too many timelines and dates to, know, uh, to remember. I'm pretty sure if you're interested and you don't have a branch in Germany, you might have to talk to a German patent attorney anyway, so they will really keep you posted on all the deadlines, uh, just as you're used to from, from your attorneys. An interesting construct, which the US patent system, uh, as far as I do, uh, do know, doesn't know, uh, are utility models. Utility models are commonly referred to as patents little siblings, mainly because the, <clears throat> the time that they can protect, <coughs> excuse me, um, your product isn't quite as long. It can only be extended for up to 10 years. However, there's a couple of really interesting aspects to this. Um, utility model protection can be sought for inventions which can be expressed via device claims. So no method claims are allowed um, for a utility model. Uh, protection duration is a maximum of 10 years. And the interesting thing is it only undergoes formal examination. So there's no search, and there's no assessment of novelty and inventiveness. However, once the utility model has been formally checked and is being entered into the German Utility Model Register, it is a title that you can sue out of. Whether that's always a smart idea is on a, a completely different um, um, piece of paper, but technically you do have a title with which you can uh, go to court with. What makes it really interesting from my point of view, while you can file any type of invention as long as you can express it by device claims, um, as a utility model, what makes it really interesting that it can be split off off from any living patent application, not a patent designating Germany. So what you could do, for example, you have a German patent application, you are dealing with the German patent office, and um, you notice an infringer of, the, of something that you believe would be patent eligible. So you could split off a utility model using claims that you think are A, novel and inventive, and B, cover um, the product of the potential infringer. You split it off, it's being formally checked, it's being entered into the register, and then you can start going to court. You don't have to wait for the German patent to issue. Of course, you can only do that if the patent hasn't been pending for 10 years, but still, it's an option. What also makes it interesting um, is you can split off several utility models. So this is not a one-time thing. You can start for, uh, splitting off a first utility model. Further down the road, you can split off a second utility model that covers you know, a little bit different uh, subject matter. And what is also interesting 
This doesn't also only account for German patent applications, but also for European patent applications, which still designate Germany as a, um, as an, as an, as a state. It can also be a PCT application, which covers Germany as a state. So the splitting off at any time is really an interesting strategic option, which um, some of our clients and also um, the, the adversaries of our clients have used uh, when it comes to uh, infringement proceedings. Um, a further specialty of utility models is that there can be double protection through a patent and a utility model. So while you can't have double protection with two patents in Germany, you can have a patent and a utility model that have pretty much identical claims and both of them offer you individual protection. Turning towards um, German litigation and defense in a super brief manner. The biggest difference I find is the split proceedings between infringement and prosecution or revocation of the patent. While the EPO or the GPTO are responsible for examining and for handling oppositions and patents, um, the nullity, which may happen after, um, after the opposition, would not be handled by the court that is actually res uh, responsible for handling the patent infringement case. It would be the German Federal Patent Court, um, which is responsible for nullifying or declaring the patent to be um, novel and inventive or, or formally um, 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 could be formally used um, as a patent. And while the patent infringement proceedings um, happen in the regional court, and then appeal goes to the higher regional court appeal, it is not until the German Federal Court of Justice, so pretty much the highest court except for the German Constitutional Court, um, that both of these proceedings are combined. So it could very well be that a patent or a regional court finds that the infringer does infringe, and then the um, German Federal Patent Court says, "Well, you know, they uh, we, we're not we're not addressing the question of infringement, but we believe this patent is invalid." Then the higher regional court of appeal, who addresses the patent infringement, would say, "Well, we still believe that it's a valid patent," and then it would be up to the Federal Court of Justice to decide what's actually the case. These split proceedings make it, on the one hand, very efficient because you can separate the question whether a patent is valid from the, patent, uh, from the question whether you infringe. On the other hand, it's also very infringer or um, patentee friendly because you can start um, suing infringers and the proceedings are independent of the nullification or revoca uh, revocation proceedings. Um, and you might end up with a title way before the German Federal Patent Court decides that the patent is to be uh, nullified. Um, that is just a super brief <laughs> run through the uh, German uh, patent infringement and uh, defense mechanisms. However, as I mentioned before, the most notable difference I find is that the institutions are split and they're only being rejoined at the highest court um, level. I mentioned beforehand that the German Act on Employees' Inventions um, is something that I find quite different from US law. When uh, we file, um, or previously, what often happened when we filed um, PCT applications um, coming from outside of Germany into Germany, especially actually from the US, 
where it used to be the case that all the inventors were the applicants and not necessarily the entity, their employee was the applicant. Changing, um, changing the applicant to the actual company uh, always entailed sending the work contract agreement between the employee and the, um, the company to the German patent office saying, this is why we believe that the applicant can actually do this or that the applicant we want to include can do this. And something that I noticed is, is that very, or not, not just rarely, it occurs that all the rights that um, arise out of patents uh, that were um, invented by some of the inventors are essentially the, um, the, uh, the company's goods and they don't need to um, re or let the um, employee participate in the money that they earn. And that's very different from the German Act on Employees Invention since that sort of codifies what needs to happen when an employee makes an invention, how he needs to be um, uh, remunerated. So this German Act, uh, German Act on Employees Inventions applies if um, an invention eligible for patent or utility model protection is made by an employee. Um, the employee's um, usual work or place of work is in Germany. Um, and if these three th things come together, then um, we can distinguish between non-free inventions and free inventions. So non-free inventions are inventions um, made during the time uh, of employment, um, which either result from the employee's obligatory activity in the company, or are substantially based on experience and activities of the company. So essentially when you have somebody working on machinery and as part of his job, he made, he made an invention that makes uh, life along the uh, machinery line a lot easier, then he might not have had the um, actual task to make this improvement. However, this invention resulted out, uh, out of his obligatory activity or uh, based on his experience. So it would be different if an employee makes uh, works in machinery and then makes an invention in something completely different. For example, uh, a pesticide that he developed in his free time while he was working in the garden. You know, that would not be an invention that even though it's an invention that happened during the time of his employment, it has nothing to do with his um, activity um, for, the, um, for the employer. Um, so there are a couple of provisions relating to non-free inventions. And one of the most important ones is the obligation to report. So an employee must report each individual non-free invention without delay in writing to the employer, who must acknowledge the time of receipt in writing without delay. Um, this report um, in German case law, there, there used to be a lot of confusion of how this report needs to be delivered, whether it could be orally or whether it had to be written. And a lot of that has been further specified uh, by case law over the last 10 years. So it needs to be in writing. And in the report, um, the employee must give notice that it's a report of an invention. And it can be a joint report if several employers are involved in this invention. And the report must describe the technical object, its solution, and how the invention was made. So simply filing an invention report saying, I made an invention in machinery and not saying what it is, is not an invention report. Um, so there needs to be more, there needs to be a solution, and uh, when the invention was made, while well, doing what activity for the employer. This um, invention report then goes to the um, employer, and the employer may claim, claim the right to the invention. And it is considered to be claimed if he doesn't do anything. 
And that's very different from 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the employer actually had to claim the invention in writing. And for, I, um, I think, eight years exactly, um, this is not the case anymore. It has been reversed. So if the employer doesn't do anything, it's automatically a claimed invention. If it's not claimed, the invention becomes free and the employee can make use of the invention without restrictions. If it is claimed, all rights regarding the invention are transferred from the employee to the employer. And at the same time, some obligations of the employer arise. So the employer's obligations after claiming right um, the employer must, without delay, apply for a patent or utility model, uh, if more appropriate, having effect in Germany unless the employee agrees to non-submission of an application or the employer has a legitimate interest to keep the invention secret provided he acknowledges patentability. So essentially that means if an employer makes an invention and you claim the invention, you need to file a patent application in most cases. Um, and this is, I think very different from, from US law where the company has a much larger influence on whether they want to uh, file the invention or not. Um, the employee doesn't have such high of an influence on this, um, on this uh, choice which needs to be made. Um, and it's also particularly interesting if you do have an office in Germany where inventions could be made and this, such an invention report is being sent you know, maybe to headquarters in the US. Um, since the working place for these people is usually Germany, you might have to adhere or uh, comply with this German Employee Invents Act. Um, what makes it even more complicated is, so once you've filed in Germany, um, you also need to offer the uh, employee in the states in which you don't choose to file, for example, via PCT, um, you must release the invention and allow the employee to file such an application. So if you file a German application and say, well, the costs are too high to file a PCT, you need to offer the employee to actually continue um, with um, this application or the possibility to, to file applications in different countries and give him a reasonable amount of time so he can do that. Um, so timing, when it comes to employees' inventions is actually something quite crucial. Um, so you don't run into trouble because you didn't give opportunity to, for the employee to claim his right. And then uh, you need to file a PCT application simply because you didn't ask him soon enough. The second or um, obligation, uh, that is important is that the employee has a claim to reasonable remuneration against the employer. And this reasonable is um, actually a constant matter of um, case law. Um, there are guidelines issued by the minister or ministry of employment. Um, and the favored way of determining an adequate remuneration is by analogy of a, of a license. So how much money would the company have to pay if they had to um, obtain a license to use this patent? And that's um, a factor, a certain factor of that uh, amount of money would probably uh, be a reasonable remuneration. So this remuneration becomes due when the employer starts using the invention. Um, and it needs to be fixed at the latest three months after grant by an agreement or if no agreement is found by the employer. So again, as in the previous slide, for the employer, timing is crucial. What makes it even more complicated is that in a lot of instances, um, you can't, you can't uh, make a contract with the employer, uh, employee that alters the right to his um, disadvantage. So uh, the law, the Employee Invents Act, actually um, may, has a couple of um, paragraphs in it which make it very difficult to 
take away certain rights from the employer. Um, so coming back to um, abandonment of applications for protective rights, um, what needs to be observed if you want to abandon an application or protective right? Um, as stated before, you must inform the employee. Um, you can't abandon the application of the protective right unless the employee has not claimed transfer of the right within three months. So the three months deadline is actually something to keep in mind when dealing with um, pretty much most of the deadlines uh, regarding the employee. Um, employer relationship after an application has been filed. Um, otherwise, the employer must transfer the right to the employee. In that case, the employer may reserve a non-exclusive right to further use the invention. So while the employee can do with the invention what it wants to do, he probably must uh, reserve a non-exclusive right to further use uh, of the invention to the, um, and give it to the employer. Coming back to the um, thing that I said at the beginning of last slide, the bind, you know, this law is binding. So they cannot be altered to the employee's disadvantage. Um, however, agreements that can be made up front for each invention um, are permit permitted after the invention has been reported. So what a lot of companies do in Germany is they have a set scheme of certain steps. Um, so they give the employee a certain amount of money after an invention record has been filed. Thereafter, they give them uh, a little bit more money once the invention has been filed and more money if uh, it results in a grant. And if then um, the revenue that they make exceeds a certain amount of money, then you need to uh, make a new individual agreement. However, that simplifies the process quite a bit. And um, um, that's one way to, to take a little bit of the heat out of this uh, issue. However, um, a lot of conflicts arise from this uh, employee inven uh, Employees Inventions Act. So it needs to be something that you keep in mind if you have offices in Germany and you're trying to manage them out of the US. And um, I do believe I am at the end of uh, my report. I, I hope uh, it gave you a small overview of some of the differences that I see. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, please go ahead. Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Opperman. Uh, we do have, we have received a couple questions. Why don't I uh, start off with one that um, is is a, addressed directly to your last topic there. Um, I, I will just go ahead and read it. Um, you, you can, I guess, it's a couple part question, so why don't you just, uh, you know, answer it as best you can. Uh, so the answer, the question goes: how, how does the Germany Employee Invention Act affect innovation? Uh, do you think there are any updates to the existing law in the near future coming? Uh, and what online resources do you recommend, um, you know, to to read up more on on that uh, particular? part of the German law? Huh, that's a lot of questions. Lot of questions. Um, <laughs> well, um, with respect to how to read it up online in English, I'm pretty sure that it's possible. Um, but I do not know the best, uh, since I've never dealt with uh, that topic that I had to read, uh, you know, I had to read up in, in in English. I would need to come back to you with an answer to that question. So, if the person who has posed that question would just, you know, uh, shoot us their email, we will. I I will try to find a source that gives you a good eye, you know, a, a, an overview of the topic. Um, regarding whether this is to change, I don't believe so. Um, I do believe that especially R&D heavy companies actually benefit from this um, because they can, you do have a certain control over the quality of the invention, 
because you can tell your um, your employee that they need to add something to the invention record because you don't believe that it's complete yet. So it's something that they can use to um, to get patent protection or at least patent applications filed in industries which are especially R&D heavy and where it takes a long time between the actual first idea and the product that ends up in the market. Um, medical technology would be such a field where, you know, the time before you know, when you have an idea to until the time when it actually ends up being a product can be very long due to um, um, FDA approval or um, EU approval. So I think in some sense it does uh, not hinder innovation. I Very do good. believe. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. That's it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. All right, so let's let's move on. We do have a number of questions, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, the next one is when is a German attorney needed if you wait the seven years before examination? Um, hold on, I need to. Um, when do you need a German attorney? Yeah, yeah. Specifically, the the questions you know asking probably asking. I mean, my. My interpretation of the question is, is during the seven years that you have the ability to wait before examination, um, mm -hmm. is there anything in that time frame that you really would need to be engaging a, a German attorney for? Well, you need a postal address. Um, so you need an address where the patent application is also uh, is actually being filed to. Uh, you know, where anything, any mail that is concerned with that is, ha needs to be filed to. And that address needs to be the address of a German attorney. So the German attorney might not do anything, which is not what we usually do. Usually we're very, very hardworking. But if he doesn't do anything because you don't file the request for examination, um, you at least would have to name a German attorney as the postal address where all the communication with so they do, so that you do have a representative in case something happens. And I don't know what could happen, but if something happens, they need the postal address of a German attorney. Very good. All right, another question. Um, does the German system have reduced fees for small or micro entities you know, like they do in the US? Um, no, you got me. I don't know. Um, I don't think so. The only fee reduction that I know of is when after you have, um, if you declare your willingness to license your patent, um, this uh, willingness to license results in a 50% reduction of the annuities. So if you believe, if you want a patent and you want to reduce the cost and you're willing to grant a license to somebody who asks for it, against you know in, in return for money of course, but um, then you can bring down your um, the um, amount of uh, money that you need to pay for the annuities by 50%. Is, is, is agreeing to licensing like this something that is commonly done or is it a fairly rare occurrence? No, it's something that's commonly done. Um, you can also uh, retract that, um, that offer. So if you, you know, if you think it's very important at some point and you don't want to uh, license it, uh, you want to take back the offer, then you can um, withdraw that request. Okay, uh, moving on to another question. What is the typical prosecution time for a, a patent versus a utility model? Mm, as I mentioned with the utility model, since it's only being checked formally, um, 
it can be entered into the register, and that's when it becomes effective, can be, I'd say, less than three months, something between two and three months. Um, that is, if you, you know, if you file it as you would file a patent application, um, and there's no formal requirements uh, that the office thinks, uh, deems necessary, it's a process of less than three months. Um, patent prosecution is harder to assess. Um, some, I mean, I've had patents that are being issued before they were published, and I've had patents that have been pending for 18 years. Um, I would say, generally, if you file, let's say, if you file the request for examination straight away, I would say probably between three and six years on average. That would be my guess. Hey, as a, as a related question, uh, are renewal or annuity fees due during the application process or during the prosecution process uh, or only after the patent issues? Yes. Um, uh, yes, they are, um, which is also, which would have been a good difference to uh, point out. Yes, you have to pay for every year that the um, application is pending, regardless of whether the patent office does anything or not. Um, I usually find that a little frustrating, especially when I haven't heard anything from the patent office in a couple of years. What we try to do as a firm, unless the um, client tells us not to, we ask about once a year. If we haven't heard back from them, we ask them about once a year, hey, what's going on? Um, to bring, you know, to not have the feeling that the application is just lying around at the office. However, uh, with, for some clients, the waiting is part of the deal. So in those cases, we don't do that. Very good. All right, uh, another question. If an application designated in Germany or, or filed in Germany has been pending for 10 years, is it is it possible to still seek protection via a utility model? Um, I fear this question would come. <laughs> um, I want to say no. Um, because only once... Um, let's postpone that question. I'll have the answer in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Very good. All right, well, the last other question that we have um, kind of gets back to the uh, Employee Invention Act. Um, if we have an employee who is a German citizen but is working in our US office, does the act still apply? So it's a German citizen German working? Citizen working in a U.S. office and the U.S. is his main office, uh, his main workplace? Let's assume that it is, yes. Okay. No, then I think uh, his work contract would also be based on U.S. law. So the German Employees in Inventions Act is not bound to nationality but by place of work. So by, by follow-on, if, if it was a German citizen who was just visiting the U.S. office, but his main place of work was in Germany, I assume then that the act would apply. I would assume so, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, we will try to follow up on the one question that stumped uh, Dr. Opperman, uh, but for mm -hmm. now we have, we have reached our time limit. Um, but we will uh, we'll try to provide an answer uh, out to the person who, who submitted that question uh, if we have their contact okay. information. Okay. But thank you everybody for your attendance and uh, the great questions, uh, appreciate it. And uh, appreciate Dr. Opperman providing his uh, insights into the German patent system. All right, thank you. Thank you.